Uh, g'day folks, uh, welcome to Church on the Phone um, and Computer. Um, we've lost power here at the church and uh, they're doing some work and they won't be getting power until probably another hour or so. So we're going to have a shorter service here today. Uh, there's quite a few people here uh, at the moment, but uh, just let you know that we'll be starting very shortly. Well, what a uh, morning. This is just like uh, in Jesus' day, I guess. No, no PA. Um, we're not on a hillside, so you can have the echo of the voice go, but I trust you can hear okay. Um, but uh, great to have you with us and those online. We've got about 16 connections. I'm not sure how the battery is on my phone yet, so we'll see how we go. Uh, should be hopefully okay for the rest of the service. Well, it's hard to believe that next Sunday is Christmas Day. I don't know about you, but I'm finding that really hard to believe that in one week's time, we're going to be celebrating Christmas Day. Again, I remind you, what time is our service? 9.30, that's good. Just want to let you know to remind you that. You know, when it comes to celebrating a birth of a child, usually, in most cases, there's a heap of excitement around the birth of a child. There's a sense of joy, a sense of excitement, a sense of anticipation of the child's arriving. And there's also some sort of anxiety and fear, too, these days about the birth of a child. And when the baby arrives, as many of you would know, the family gather together to celebrate the birth of the child, the grandparents, the great-grandparents. And I know for many of you here today, uh, you've travelled afar to go and see a grandchild uh, that has been born into the family. I know for my own four children, there was an incredible sense of joy and excitement in being able to meet them, being able to see them, being able to hold them and to celebrate the birth of them. However, particularly with our firstborn, Michael, our firstborn son, there was a sense of fear and excitement, but also fear and, and, and worry about, is it going to be okay? Is everything going to be okay? But also the next question was, well, am I going to be a good father? Like, this is all new to me. And there was this whole stress and tension around the birth of a child. Today, I also want to acknowledge that for many, a birth of a child is far from a joyful time. Sometimes with unwanted pregnancies, complications around the birth and the health of a child, pregnancies and births can be sometimes the most painful and most tragic event in people's lives. And you can have all sorts of emotions from incredible joy to incredible pain. And as we look at the story of Joseph and Mary and the birth of the baby Jesus, I want to suggest today that they experienced every aspect of what I've just said about the birth of a child. There was joy. There was celebration. There was fear. There was pain. There was trauma. There was sorrow. They experienced everything. And we're going to look at that today as we unpack the scripture this morning. Let me pray together as we start. Father God, as we open your word this morning, I pray that you would speak into our lives and, Father, you would remind us of just how precious the birth of Jesus was. And, Father, how the fact that he continues to impact us today, thousands of years after his physical birth on this earth. Lord God, I pray for those amongst us who are wrestling with this time of the year, whether it's to do with family conflict, whether it's to do with health issues, whether it's to do with the grief and loss. Father, we pray that your hand of grace would be upon us all, that you would just speak to us and encourage us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to do something a little bit different today. And I guess uh, the interesting thing is we were planning on a baptism today and I'd planned a whole bunch of stuff around leading into the baptism. So I've scrapped all that. And uh, last night I was just praying through about, you know, where do we go with that this morning? And then thinking, well, what if we didn't have power? I couldn't use slides and videos and all sorts of stuff. So what I want to do is take a snapshot of the birth of Jesus and really celebrate, but look at what it is that Mary and Joseph are facing in the midst of that. So right at the start of the birth of Jesus, before even the physical birth, around 700 plus years or even before that, the whole of the Old Testament is prophecies leading up to the birth of Jesus. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, we read that famous uh, prophecy of Jesus' birth, which is about 700 years before his physical birth. We read these words. And if you look at the screen, it's not there. So you just have to trust me in the reading of the scripture. Um, Isaiah 9 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. 
The government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and the peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, established and upholding it with justice and righteousness for that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And throughout the whole of the Old Testament, we read the fact that Jesus is coming. And there's this preparation. There's this massive lead up, massive build up. And as I said, when Isaiah was quoted, around about 700 years have passed. I want you to think about that. 700 years. Our country is only a couple of hundred years old. We're talking about many generations who, who have wrestled with this. And, and, and there's this sense of silence in this period between the Old Testament and New Testament where people didn't know what God was doing, even though God was always at work. And then as we looked a few weeks ago in Luke chapter 1, we read of the miraculous conception that the angel came and visited Mary. And we read this in Luke chapter 1. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at the words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favour with God and you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He'll be great and he'll be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Here's this young girl, most likely around 14 years of age, around that sort of age being pledged to be married to Joseph and suddenly she's found out that she's going to be having a child. Imagine how she dealt with that. She basically said in scripture, let it be so, but then she had to go and have a conversation with her parents, had to have a go have a conversation with Joseph. And you can imagine, as we saw a few weeks back when we looked at this particular scripture, there would have probably been some questions asked. Mary, what is going on here? Is this really true what you're saying? And we know that Joseph was a, a righteous man and a man who followed the law and wanted to make sure that, that everything was done. He was marrying a virgin. That was what he was doing. Under the law, this is what he was to do. And it says in verse 19 of Matthew chapter 1, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, following the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. That was the plan. <laughs> His soon-to-be wife has suddenly found out she's pregnant and in his mind he's thinking she's been up to something, therefore I'm going to divorce her, I'll end the relationship, it's over and it's done. And yet we read in Scripture again in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, that God speaks to Joseph in a dream. But after he considered this, that is to divorce and to, to cut off the relationship with Mary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son and you'll give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. And we read this in Isaiah chapter 7. It says the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave, them, he gave him the name Jesus. So Joseph now is taking Mary as his wife. And you can imagine, though, there still would have been some conversation around the family that suddenly now Mary's pregnant, what's going on, Joseph? You're now getting married. You know, there's a whole lot of conversation. There probably would have been some gossip around the time of what's going on. This is not the normal celebration of the birth. What we read in Scripture then is that Mary, once she found out that she was pregnant and, and, and Joseph had told the family and everything, Mary shoots off and spends about three months at Elizabeth's place. This is her cousin. And we know Elizabeth is the, the mother of John the Baptist, and she also had a miraculous conception. In her old age, she was given a child, which is John the Baptist. And what we read is that Elizabeth, uh, Mary runs off to Elizabeth's place, and Elizabeth's around about six months pregnant at this time. 
So we read in Luke chapter 1, verse 39, Mary didn't waste a minute. She got up and traveled to the town of Judah in the hill country, straight to Zachariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in her womb leaped. She was filled with the Holy Spirit and sang out exuberantly, you are so blessed among women and the babe in your womb are blessed, is blessed. And why am I so blessed that the mother of my Lord visits me? The moment the sound of your greeting entered my ears, the babe in my womb skipped like a lamb for the sheer joy. Blessed woman who believe what God said, believe every word would come true. And for about three months, Elizabeth and Mary spent time together. And you can imagine that Elizabeth's in her her, her final trimester of pregnancy. Um, Mary's in her first trimester. And you can imagine the conversations going on about the pregnancies. Not only was that both miraculous pregnancies and something special was about to happen, they were able to journey together for about three months. Now, the Bible doesn't actually give us the insight here whether Mary actually got to be with Elizabeth in the pregnancy uh, with the birth of John the Baptist, but I think it's possible. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, we read, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, that's when God sent Gabriel to speak to Mary, and that's when she ran off to uh, see see Elizabeth. So she's been pregnant for six months. And then in Luke chapter 1, verse 56, we read that Mary stayed with Elizabeth for, for about three months and then went home. So you add six and three, to me, adds up to what? Nine, which means she must have been very close to actually giving birth to John the Baptist. So either Mary either got to see John the Baptist or very closely got to see John the Baptist. But whatever the case is, we actually read in Luke chapter 1 that there was a great celebration when John the Baptist was born. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbours and relatives heard the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. So her relatives and her neighbours. We know that Mary was one of her relatives. So we're not sure exactly there what that happened. Theologians debate about that, but it is possible that she was able to celebrate with Elizabeth the birth of John. But what we do know is that then basically Mary goes back with Joseph and because of the census, they have to then travel to Bethlehem. We read in Luke chapter 2 that at the time the Roman Empire Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quinius was the governor of Syria. All returned to their own and central town to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea and David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. So we now have this story where now Mary and Joseph in the midst of the pregnancy now have to travel about 160 k's by foot to the town where they could be registered. And at this time, this is where the birth happened. And what we know is the birth happened not in a four-star hospital resort. It happened out the back in the stables. Luke chapter 2 says, And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in snuggling in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. So even the birth, the actual physical birth, as we know, was in the stables, was in the place where the the animals were kept because there was no other room. But not only that, as they've had the birth and Jesus is now physically in this earth and they're celebrating the birth and we can imagine as parents they're celebrating. A, that the actual birth happened safely because back then many births didn't happen safely, but actually Jesus arrived safely and there was this celebration that this baby that they'd been working and praying and, 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 and nurturing for nine months has now appeared physically upon this earth. You can imagine Joseph and Mary, the joy that they had, and then suddenly they're interrupted by a bunch of shepherds. Complete strangers rock up and knock up and come into their room. Now, I don't know about you, but strangers you don't normally welcome into this sort of scenario, but suddenly there's these strangers that rock up. In Luke chapter 2, we read, that the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign to you. You'll find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. 
Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those whom favour his favour rest. And we have these sense where the, the, shep- the shepherds rock up and start speaking into the life of Jesus, the fact that the angels appeared and this is what happened. And Mary and Joseph are hearing all of this. They're celebrating the fact that there's something about their child. They knew right from the start that this was God's child and suddenly now these shepherds appear, these outcasts, these people who, are, who, who wouldn't normally even gather into a venue like this are suddenly there with joy and they then start spreading the word about this baby. We then know as we read in scripture that after Jesus was born physically, eight days later, he was presented at the temple through the customary of being circumcised and being named and also having the time of purification. In Luke chapter 2, we read this. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus. So they gave him the name Jesus, the name given by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took to him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered a sacrifice requiring in the law of law of the Lord's either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So basically they've gone to have uh, Jesus circumcised and officially named. It's a naming ceremony back then. And also this time of purification where they actually presented and acknowledged that, that this is their firstborn child and they're presenting it to God and as, as an offering of saying, we thank you for this child. And why they're having this time of, 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 of naming and, and purification, we read of these two older people who have been hanging around the temple who had been hanging out waiting for Jesus to arrive. We read of a guy by the name of Simeon who basically was an old guy who had been waiting uh, for this moment. We read this in Luke chapter 2. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was a righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he see the Lord's Messiah. How how would you like that? You're not going to die until you see the Son of God. Moved by the spirit, he went to the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was accustomed by the law, that is the the naming, the circumcision and the the, the offering of the doves, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. In other words, I can die. I can finally die in peace because it says, For my eyes have seen your salvation which have been prepared in the sight of all nations, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother, as in Joseph and Mary, marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign of that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. Ouch. (laughs) There's some good things about that, but there's also a bit of pain happening. Imagine if you are Mary and Joseph. You've had shepherds come up. You've now gone to do the customary thing in the temple. And suddenly this old guy, a stranger, yet again, grabs your child and speaks a prophecy of what is to come. But it doesn't stop there because Simeon then goes off and dies. <laughs> Not necessarily straight away, but the Lord, Lord, Lord says he's ready to die. But then what we have is Anna, another lady who was there. And it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 36, there was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Phenuel and the tribe of Asher. She was very old. We don't know how old, but very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. That's old. She never <laughs> left the temple, but worshipped night. Hey, it's biblical. It's biblical. I'm just, I'm just reading the Bible here. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. 
So now Anna and Simeon are now speaking into Mary and Joseph and, and have seen the Son of God. And what we get now is, is, is Mary and Joseph raise Jesus. And no doubt, and, and this is we don't get this in actual scripture because it's not in detail form, but as we know from a baby's perspective, Jesus had to learn to eat solids. He had to learn to walk. He had to learn to be toilet trained. He was fully human. He pooed his nappy. How dare, you know, some people were shocked with that, but this is the reality. He was a baby. And all the stuff that happens with a normal baby, Jesus had to experience. And what we read in Luke chapter 2, verse 39, when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong and was filled with wisdom and grace of God was on him. But before all that happened, what we do know is that before he turned two years of age, so we're really not sure exactly what age he is, but somewhere probably between one and two years of age, they have another visitor. But this time it's actually three people who are very wise men, the Magi. And we actually read in Matthew chapter 2 that they were instructed by the king. They set off. There was a star that appeared, the same star they'd seen in the eastern skies. It led them on until they'd hovered over the place of the child. They could hardly contain themselves. They were in the right place. They arrived at the right time and they entered the house and they saw the child in the arms of Mary, his mother. Overcome, they kneeled and worshipped him. And they opened their luggage and presented gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. They've had the shepherds, they've had Anna and Simeon, they've had now these magi that have rocked up, presented all these incredibly expensive gifts. And what we read in Luke chapter 2, verse 12, verse 19, it says that Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. There's a celebration about this child, but there's also glimpses of what the heck is going on. What is really to come with our child? There's incredibly joy, there's incredible celebration, but there's also this unknown of what is really going to happen. And then what we actually read is their sense of joy suddenly turns to, dare I say, trauma and fear. We read in the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 13, that after the wise men were gone, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up. Flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. The angel said, stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt and the child with the child, Mary and his mother. And they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken about to the spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. I want you to think about this for a moment. In the midst of their celebration, in the midst of the joy of now having possibly a toddler in the house or at least a baby that's now rolling over and and maybe eating solids and and, and being a bit more in a personality, suddenly now they've got to flee because the, the king is trying to kill the baby. There's a bit of anxiety happening there for them, a bit of fear. But not only did they have the opportunity of escaping and they got out, I could imagine them opening up the news reports of the day when suddenly they realised that not only did their baby survive, but what it led to is many babies dying. Matthew 2.16 says, Herod, when he realised that the scholars had tricked him, flew into rage. He commanded he commanded the murder of every little boy two years old and under who lived in Bethlehem and its surrounding hills. He determined that age from the information he got from the scholars. That's when Jeremiah's sermon was fulfilled. A sound was heard in Roma, weeping and much lament. Rachel weeping for her children, Rachel refusing all solace, her children gone dead and buried. Have you ever thought about the fact that there was a time when Mary and Joseph were holding their child knowing that many other children had died because of what had happened with them? Now, in Bethlehem, they supposed that it was around about 30 to 40 children that were killed on that day, looking at the population. Murdered, ripped out of the arms of the parents, screaming, no doubt, for their child and killed. A 
Imagine the guilt that, oh, I, I imagine that the guilt that Mary and Joseph probably would have had about the fact that they got away, but all these other people lost their children. What we read later on in Matthew chapter 2, verse 19, that when Herod died, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream again to Joseph in Egypt. He said, get up, the angel said, take your child and his mother back to the land of Israel because those who are trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, Achilles, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. This was fulfilled what the prophet said, he will be called a Nazarene. And sadly, that's not the last time someone was going to threaten to kill their son. Mary and Joseph's celebration of a birth was from one extreme to the next. They must have had incredibly highs and incredible joys and incredible sorrows. And dare I say, right at the start, as I said, they've experienced every aspect of the celebration of a child in the good and the bad. But the interesting thing is that the birth of Jesus continues to impact this world every single day. There was two main responses to the birth of Jesus. Herod's response was he saw Jesus as a threat and he wanted to get rid of that threat and he had incredible hatred towards this child. And dare I say there are many in our community that have the same response that instead of celebrating the birth of a child, instead of celebrating the life of Jesus, all they do is see Jesus as a threat. And they want Jesus gone. They want to get rid of him. They remove Jesus from the carols, from prayers, from faith, from schools. They want to take Jesus out of everything. Even they want to take Jesus out of Christmas, which is laughable. You know, when we used to run the Ballarat carols, one of the biggest complaints we got from people is all the God stuff at the carols. And you'd get the you'd get the messages, what the heck has Jesus got to do with Christmas? I kid you not. We used to get the complaint over and over and over again that there was too much God stuff at Christmas. Well, the problem is, folks, people don't want to celebrate Christmas. They don't want to celebrate Christ. And people will do everything to get rid of Jesus. They have a hatred towards Jesus, the church, and dare I say, even all people who follow Jesus. There's an attitude out there that they don't want a bar of this. They don't want to know any of this. But yet the other side of the coin is an attitude of the shepherds and the Magi and Simeon and Anna. They desired to see Jesus. They made sacrifices in travel and, and, and all sorts of finances just to be able to see Jesus. They were full of joy when they see Jesus. They offered gifts, sacrificial gifts to see Jesus. They bowed and worshipped Jesus. They followed Jesus and they spread the news about Jesus. We're living in a world where the same thing happens today. There are many people out to destroy Jesus but there are many people like you and I that want to celebrate and spread the news and enjoy the time that Jesus is celebrated for this season of his birth. You know, next Sunday we are going to celebrate in full detail his birthday. And I asked the question this morning for those who are here in person and those on the phone and computer, how's your celebration going to look? Are you going to be celebrating with incredible joy or is there stuff in your life that you're going to be wrestling with? Because this birth of Jesus is good news for all of us. And all he desires is for us to be in relationship with him. That's the only thing he desires. If you want to offer a birthday gift to the birthday boy this Christmas, what he wants is your heart. What he wants is a relationship with him. Nothing else, 
just that relationship. And maybe this Christmas we need to examine ourselves and just ask how much of a gift are we giving the Saviour of the world? Are we actually giving him all of ourselves or not? As we celebrate the fact that he has come and he has come upon this earth and he lived upon this earth and he showed us how to live in relationship with God the Father. And not only that, he died upon the cross and rose again that we may have life eternal and that may we live life to the full on this earth. Let me pray. Father, I want to thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, as we've had a snapshot of the whole of the Christmas story, Father, I thank you so much that, Father, we have it documented that we can refer to it and read it and we too can celebrate the birth of Jesus. But, Father, I pray for those that we know and those within our community who are trying to do everything they can to destroy Jesus this Christmas. I pray, Lord God, that you'd help us to be your hands and feet and voice, to speak into their lives, to love them for who they are, and to let them know that Jesus loves them so very much. Father, I pray for our families as we gather with families over these next few weeks. Many of them aren't followers of you. And again, Lord, we pray that we may be able to speak the joy and the life and the hope that Jesus brings at this season. May we all be like the shepherds, be willing to go and spread the news of our Saviour's birth, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for being online and with us. Uh, we've still got no power here, but we've got the hot water boiling on the stove, I hope. Well, okay. maybe. Either that or the house is burnt down, I'm not sure. But uh, we're going to uh, close our service. And again, encourage you to stay, have a few nibblies or at least mingle together. And uh, don't forget to come back here 9.30 uh, next Sunday as we celebrate Christmas Day. But let me pray. Father God, again, we thank you that we can be here today. We thank you, Lord God, that you're present through the power of your spirit. And I pray, Lord God, that you would watch over and protect us as we go from here. And particularly this week as we lead up to your birthday celebration, Lord, may we be really aware of your presence. May you remind us of the fact that we are your hands and feet and voice to this community. And I just pray blessing upon us all now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.